Chapter 5 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Herward Carrington. Chapter 5 Orthodox Theology has always taught us that when we die, we pass into either one of two places, heaven or hell. The Catholic Church introduces a third intermediary state, purgatory. And when in this state, souls may be helped either by those who have passed over or by the prayers of the living. It will thus be seen that, in this respect at least, the Catholic Church approaches nearer than any other religion the doctrines of spiritualism. Information regarding the spirit world has come to us in various ways. Seers or clairvoyants have gone on spiritual excursions into the spiritual world and have told us, on coming back, what they have remembered of their clairvoyant visions. Moses, St. John Swedenborg, Andrew Jackson Davis, and others were seers of this type. On the other hand, we have the direct statements of spirits who have come back and related to us the precise conditions existing in the next world. From both these sources, spiritualists have succeeded in constructing a fairly complete representative picture of the next life and its various activities. I propose here to give a rapid and more or less dogmatic resume of these teachings without fully endorsing them myself, but merely asking the reader to form his own opinion concerning them. Parent Contradictions There are various contradictory teachings regarding the future state which have been given us from time to time in the past, and it has been held by many that because of these contradictions, none of them can be trusted. Consequently, none of the descriptions can be true. Thus, spirits who return through many French mediums declare that reincarnation is a fact, while those who return through English and American mediums declare that it is not a fact, etc. How are we to account for these discrepancies? As this is a stumbling block to many spiritualists, the reason for these contradictions must be given at once. The answer is, as a matter of fact, simple enough. Spirits tell us that, after death, they are by no means omniscient. On the contrary, they enter the next life as before said, carrying with them all their prejudices, beliefs, and preconceived opinions. Now, this being the case, we can see that a spirit who, when alive, believed in reincarnation, would, after death, continue to believe in it, and he would naturally gather round him or drift into the company of those who also believed in it. In returning through a medium, therefore, he would state dogmatically that reincarnation was true. He would merely express his own belief, which might or might not be true. On many points of this nature, we have no absolute means of arriving at the truth. Spirits tell us their convictions, their beliefs, and these are founded on observation or the wisdom of those spirits who have progressed greatly since their departure from earth. The Doctrine of Zones and Spheres Many spirits teach us that the spirit world is composed of a number of zones and spheres, one upon the other. Some have stated that there are 32 such zones, others 16, but the greater number have declared that there are but seven, beginning with the one nearest the earth in which are earthbound spirits, and progressing gradually until they are inhabited by more and more spiritualized beings. These zones are said to exist one beyond the other, 
like the various layers of an onion. On the other hand, others tell us that there are no such things as zones or spheres, but that heaven or hell are merely mental states, and that the various degrees of spiritual perfection represent the different zones. They do not occupy space, that is. They exist purely in the mind of the individual. Yet, perhaps, these two may be but two aspects of a single truth. It is only natural to suppose that those of similar interests would gravitate together just as they do in this life and shun the society of others less evolved than themselves unless they chose voluntarily to help them as occasion arose. This being the case, those more advanced spiritually would congregate in certain places, and those less advanced would gather together in other places, so that although the zones would not exist as physical spheres shut off from each other by physical barriers, as many believe, yet they exist practically, the barrier being a mental or spiritual one, Conditions and Occupations in the Spirit World Spiritualism teaches that the next life is a busy one, that we continue our pursuits, activities, and interests, just as we do here, only under more favorable conditions. Evolution reigns supreme, just as it does in this world. This is only natural and rational, and what we should expect. It is a gradual continuation and process of advancement. The next world is said to be more or less a duplicate of this one. Those who are interested in learning may attend lectures or schools of instruction, may read, write, compose, paint, play, etc., just as they do here. The scenery is more or less similar to the scenery on this earth, although more beautiful and perfect in every respect. We are told that children never enter the lower spheres, nor are there any flowers in these spheres. They are found only in the higher spheres or more advanced stages. These spheres can influence one another more or less directly to a great extent, and particularly the higher spheres can exert a helpful influence on the lower ones. For this reason, progress is always possible for a spirit who desires it. He can secure assistance from those who are more advanced than he is in the spiritual world. His progress would, therefore, be rapid, and it all depends upon individual effort how rapid this will be. The sooner a spirit realizes his own possibilities and the fact that his own future happiness or unhappiness depends upon himself, the more rapidly will he advance. The Spirit Body Spirits tell us that we inhabit in the next life a body similar to the material body, but representing the glow of youth in its strength and purity. The spirit of man is ever young, and that being so, it assumes that rejuvenated outward appearance upon entering the new life. This etheric body is incapable of fatigue and is fed by the magnetic and spiritual forces which surround it in that sphere. Children entering the new life gradually grow to maturity though more rapidly than they do on this earth, because greater advantages are offered them, and progress is consequently swifter. At the age of greatest mental and spiritual maturity, they cease growing, and thenceforward remain in that perfected condition. On entering the spirit world, upon entering the next life, the human spirit is met by friends or relatives who have before passed over 
and who are drawn by natural magnetic attraction and sympathetic interest to those who have just entered the spirit world. When the spirit enters the next life, it undergoes, in a way, a new birth and is for some time bewildered. This is only natural after the shock and wrench of death. When we have had an accident in this life and have been knocked unconscious, the process of regaining consciousness is peculiar. When such a man opens his eyes, objects are presented to him vaguely, indistinctly. He would see men as trees walking. Sounds would be heard, but faintly. There would be a vague jumble of noises, and no definite and articulate sounds would be recognized at first, until consciousness was more fully restored. Thoughts would be scattered, incoherent, and only the strongest stimuli would focus the attention on any definite object for longer than a few moments at a time. When a man dies, the departure of the soul from the body must be as great as a strain upon the surviving consciousness as any accident could be, especially in cases of sudden death, suicide, and in those cases where the patient is said to die hard. Of course, after a little time, the spirit survives the initial shock and soon becomes adjusted to the new environment and condition. And this fact would account for the bewilderment and confusion which many spirits seem to experience upon their entering into the next life. It is only natural and what we should expect. Sex in the spirit world. Many have asked whether the distinction of sex is maintained in the next life whether man continues to be man and woman, woman. Here again, many different opinions have been expressed by those who have passed over, but the majority seem to contend that the distinction between male and female is fundamental, mentally and spiritually, no less than physically. And for this reason, they are destined to be more or less different for all time. This does not mean, as many think, that woman is there, as she is here, too often, in a condition of subservience or inferiority. On the other hand, she is man's equal, in many particulars, in some ways inferior to him, and in some ways superior. It is a question of differing viewpoints and constitution. Each may attain perfection and ultimate complete happiness in their own particular way, just as every individual here must obtain in his own way. As to the relations of the sexes in the next life, the teaching of the highest spirits is that there is love, harmony, sympathy, cooperation, and a mental and spiritual blending together of their natures, which corresponds to physical love on this plane. Earthbound spirits in the lowest plane are said to be unable to get away from the atmosphere and magnetic attraction of this earth, and do not care to, even if they could. They are the cause of much of the trouble which mediums experience, often causing obsession by delivering false or lying messages. There seems to be a law which permits spirits from the higher zones to descend into the lower zones, but the reverse of this does not take place. Thus, there are good or spiritual influences always playing upon the lower spheres from the higher spheres, and progress is thus rendered easy to those who care to take advantage of their opportunities. Where and how spirits live? Many of the descriptions which have been given to us indicate that spirits inhabit houses or mansions very similar to our own, and that the scenery of the spirit land is also similar to that of the earth plane, 
only more beautiful. Garments of variegated colors are said to be worn, as well as ornaments for those who care for them. The occupations of spirits are many and varied. Time is not spent in the spiritual spheres, as many imagine, in idleness or in religious devotions. How Spirits Talk The spirit body, in the spirit heaven, is thus as material to them as our world, only it exists on a different plane of activity and vibrates at a different rate of activity from ours. Hence, it is invisible to us, as we are usually invisible to them. And it requires clairvoyance on the part of spirits to perceive the material world, just as it does on the part of mortals to perceive the spiritual world. Conversation between spirits is carried on by a species of thought exchange, or telepathy. Though the conversation appears perfectly natural and as though delivered by means of mouth, as it is with us, we can form some idea as to how natural this would be from our dreams when the exchange of thought is purely mental. Yet the words spoken to each other by the dream figures seem as natural and as sonorous as our usual conversation. Insanity and Spirits There are, strictly speaking, no insane spirits, it is said, except in the earth spheres, and these, previous to their insanity, were degraded spiritually and morally. They frequently continue in some degree insane for a long period of time, their spiritual condition not being favorable to their restoration, and here they are often attracted to mortals with like tendencies whom they obsess and through whom they ventilate their own disordered fancies and even impel them to acts of violence. However, as much insanity is caused by disorders of the links between body and mind, and as these are all severed at the moment of death, the mind is usually normal and sound, as soon as it enters the spirit world. And in any case, it recovers very rapidly upon its entrance into that realm. How Spirits Travel Spirits are said to possess the ability to move from place to place with extreme rapidity, the fact as quick as thought, as the saying is. It is as easy for one to imagine oneself in China or in England as it is to imagine oneself in Brooklyn, if one is living in New York. The one process takes no longer than the other, and as you are in the spirit world, where your thoughts and interests are, you may readily perceive that it takes you no longer to reach one place than it does another. However incredible this may seem at first sight, it is quite intelligible when we remember the rapidity with which wireless messages travel. Flying through space at the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second, this would carry these waves nearly seven and a half times around the world in one second. And it has been experimentally proven that these electric waves do travel at that rate. Such being the case, we can, at least, conceive that thought can travel at as quick a rate, however inconceivable it may appear to our reason. Good and Evil Spirits We have heard much of obsessing and lying spirits, of evil spirits, and those who work harm, but we must remember that there are spirits of quite another character in the heavens who are said to protect and guard us, give us wise counsel and advice, and are, in fact, veritable guardian angels. Their duty is to impress our minds and by this means to instruct and guide us, to instill good thoughts and resolves, admonish us of our faults, reprove us when we go astray, and assist in the development of special talents. 
They do not interfere directly in the physical world, but impress our minds, influencing them in this way or in that. The Doctrine of Correspondences There is said to be a definite agreement or correspondence between the material and spiritual order of things. What we perceive as a tree in this world is only the outward manifestation of the real spiritual tree lying within it, and this is true of all physical manifestations and facts which we see in nature. Every physical body has a corresponding spiritual body behind it, and this fact gives rise to the famous doctrine of correspondences. Elaborated by Swedenborg, this correspondence throws a little light on the bewildering fact that spirits often speak of spirit gold, spirit marble, spirit houses, spirit books, etc., as if they were tangible realities, not, of course, that these are sublimations of corresponding objects of earth, existent throughout but different as to material, yet sufficiently alike to be called by the same name. In other words, these spirit objects are expressed in a different vehicle of the nature which is to us, externalized as gold, marble, etc. We must endeavor to realize the reality of the spiritual world, which we have been unaccustomed to think of as in any way substantial owing to the teachings of theology. The Difficulty of Describing the Spirit World It is impossible to express things psychic adequately in direct language for the simple reason that our words are images drawn from material things and their effects. Immaterial things and the life beyond must, therefore, generally be described by symbols rather than by words, and these symbols, whether seen in vision or representing themselves to the mind in the normal state, partake less of the seer's idiosyncrasies than any direct language would do. This symbolism is often carried to a high place in interpretation, so much so that the original is almost lost sight of. Of this, however, we shall speak at length of the chapter devoted to symbolism. There is much evidence to show that spirits can create forms and objects by the mere exercise of their volition. They build up what appear to be solid objects by the use of their minds, and these objects are often mistaken by the spirits for realities. Thus, thought forms may be created by a spirit intelligence, and this is a fact which many spiritualists have overlooked, though it is an important one as I shall endeavor to show later. Darkness and Light Wrong and evil, in some ways, seem connected with darkness. Unhappy spirits always complain that they can find no light. But as they progress, the darkness seems to lift, and light begins to dawn. This does not mean that they emerge from a material darkness into a material light, but go through a process of psychic evolution, which would, in their own minds, correspond to this. The quickest way for an unhappy spirit to progress towards the light is for it to help and comfort or assist another in like condition. Unfortunately, they are very often ignorant of this, but fortunately, many spiritualists have done a great deal of good in the seance room, etc., by giving this knowledge to spirits of a low order. Many of the spirits who have passed over, being nearer earth than heaven, soon after their transition are more easily reached by the living than by other spirits. So far as comfort and advice and assistance are concerned, and for this reason, prayers of the living are often of great help to those who have recently passed over 
and are extremely earthbound by reason of their mental and moral characteristics. Ordinary advice and assistance may also be given to these spirits at a seance. Visits to the Spirit World The spirit world can occasionally be visited, it is said, by the spirit of the sleeper or the somnambulist, and the deeper the sleep, the more separated from the body is the spirit until in deep trance. The spirit is sometimes entirely withdrawn. In deep sleep, also, the spirit occasionally goes on clairvoyant excursions and comes back to its normal body, remembering much that it has seen in the spiritual realms. In the state of ecstasy, these voyages are often made and the seer will retain a certain amount of consciousness of this earth and be able to dictate to those about him his impressions while visiting the spiritual world and while seeing more or less clearly what is happening there. Spirits are said to exercise free will and have far more liberty of choice in the next world than they do here, where they are bound by habit and tradition no less than by mental and physical obstructions and difficulties. The psychic gifts of spirits are far more highly developed than they were when on this earth, and they are frequently capable of exercising the faculty of foreknowledge or provision as well as other supernormal powers such as telepathy, clairvoyance, and clairaudience. Infinite Intelligence They are also able to perceive the general plan of nature far more thoroughly and effectively than we, because they have, so to speak, a greater mental grasp of the universe in its entirety. And many spirits who have died while disbelieving in an infinite intelligence have, as time progressed, shown that they have more or less changed their viewpoint and now are more definitely religious than they were before. As Dr. Kroll says, I have constantly been impressed with the numerous proofs of the creative and sustaining power of deity, and step by step I have been led to undoubtedly believe that he, though not in human form, is everywhere present, the creator, preserver, and controller of all things, literally God, in the most comprehensive sense of the term, with whom all wisdom and power and infinite love extends to all his creatures. This is the effect of these investigations upon my mind, and I am disposed to believe that similar and more extended researches by others in the future will lead all true, earnest spiritualists to the same belief, and thus modern spiritualists will be stamped with the higher polity of true religion, with a correct, though necessarily limited, conception of God's character, and of his relations to us, and of ours to him. Shall we see God? However this may be, it is claimed that spirits, for some time after transition, at least do not definitely know anything more about the nature or extent of this infinite intelligence than we do. They do not pass directly into the presence of any deity, as theology tells us. Questioned on this fact, they reply, I do not know. However, as they progress in spiritual perception and understanding, they gradually perceive that the universe, instead of being a chaos due to chance, is orderly and systematic and governed by a supreme or infinite intelligence which is the guiding principle involved, and that it would only be logical to believe that such an intelligence necessarily existed. The spirit world, the source of energy. The spiritual world is the source of all energy. 
even in this life our energy is derived from some spiritual source the nature of life is as yet unknown and there is every indication that it is due to some spiritual influx acting upon and through the material world one proof of this is that during the hours of sleep when the body is resting and passive the nervous or spiritual energy is revived the body is recharged as it were in the same way as a storage battery might be recharged with electric energy this process does not depend upon any material condition for sleep can often revive us instantly as many can attest in moments of extreme exhaustion the head may drop to the breast for a fraction of a second and a moment later consciousness be regained yet in that moment of time some complete spiritual revivification has taken place the energy of the body seems to have been recharged or replenished and new energy infused from some spiritual source in a manner which would be quite inexplicable were we to depend upon the ordinary teachings of science to explain such facts the phenomena and teachings of spiritualism alike constitute a great solace and comfort to many souls in distress and sorrow the proof that death does not end all and that the individual human spirit continues to exist as an entity and in precisely the same form as it is now is a great comfort to the majority of persons in this way the teachings of spiritualism are a solace to those who accept them to those who not only believe but are enabled to obtain some of the varied phenomena this assurance and consolation is doubly true the different kinds of spiritual gifts there are many spiritual gifts as st paul says in his message to the corinthians he wrote now there are diversities of gifts but the same spirit and there are differences of administrations but the same lord and there are diversities of operations but it is the same god which worketh all in all but the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit withal for to one is given by the spirit the word of wisdom to another the word of knowledge by the same spirit to another faith by the same spirit to another the gift of healing by the same spirit to another the working of miracles to another prophecy to another discerning of spirits to another diverse kinds of tongues to another the interpretation of tongues but all these worketh that one and the self same spirit dividing to every man severely as he will 1 corinthians chapter 12 how any one can disbelieve in spirit communication on the ground that it is contrary to bible teachings after the above passage it is hard to comprehend since here are a large number of spirit manifestations clearly outlined and stated by the apostle to be manifestations of the divine spirit end of chapter five Chapter 6 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Hereward Carrington Chapter 6 The Health of Mediums and Psychics The health, bodily, mentally, and spiritually, of mediums is a very important factor in all mediumistic and psychic development, far more so than is usually realized. In the first place, we have a certain amount of bodily energy in order to accomplish anything we desire in life, and this energy comes largely from physical health. Mediums have found to their cost that the production of phenomena, especially of the physical order, is at times a very exhausting process, and unless they keep themselves in good bodily health, they discover that they become run down and nervously exhausted, 
in which case they render themselves subject to insomnia, depressing mental emotions, and if this gets worse, to obsession and even greater dangers and difficulties. It is very important, therefore, for all mediums to keep up their physical health. A healthy brain. The mind of man depends largely upon the condition of his brain, and if this is not rested, freshened, and supplied in abundance with rich, healthy blood, his mental life suffers in consequence, for we know that any poisonous substance mixed with the blood immediately affects the mind by circulating through the delicate substance of the brain. The tiny nerve cells all over the body, which are the storehouses of energy, may be compared to a number of tiny cups which we fill with energy every night during sleep and more or less empty every day. Our duty is to keep these little cups brimful, and if we allow them to become too emptied so that nothing is left, we run into danger of nervous exhaustion, neurasthenia, etc. The first thing which the medium must pay attention to is, therefore, the state of his physical health, and the following rules will be found helpful by all those who wish to attain this condition. Deep Breathing Exercises in the first place, a certain number of deep breathing exercises should be taken every day. These serve to keep the lungs active and to massage the internal organs. But deep breathing exercises have a more potent and far-reaching effect than this. There is a peculiar life-giving property in fresh air, and if we do not breathe this fully, we never live as completely and receive as large a supply of the vital and magnetic currents of the universe as we otherwise would. If any one doubts this, he has but to stand erect and take half a dozen deep breathing exercises as directed below, and he will feel energized from top to toe. The way to take these breathing exercises so as to get the best results is as follows. 1. How to breathe. Stand before an open window or out of doors, free from all restrictive clothing. Before beginning, exhale forcibly, bending the body forward and relaxing the muscles. Place both open hands over the abdomen. Now breathe as deeply as possible against these hands, expanding the abdomen as much as possible without allowing the chest or ribs to expand in the least. In other words, breathe with abdomen only. After you have done this five or six times, place both your hands against your ribs on either side. Now breathe in deeply, pressing out the ribs, but without allowing either the abdomen or the upper chest to expand. After you have done this five or six times, place your hands on the upper chest just below the neck and breathe with this portion of the lungs without allowing either the ribs or the abdomen to expand. At first you will find it very difficult to control your breathing, limiting it to these parts of the lungs, but this will come with practice and it will be shown later in chapter 41 how important these breathing exercises are when the psychic side of the breathing exercises is understood. The Psychic Complete Breath after you have mastered these three separate steps, you will be enabled to take what is known as a complete breath, that is, one which expands first the abdomen, then the ribs, then the upper chest. You should by this time have such control over your breathing that you are enabled to do this in three distinct stages, or merge them together into one as you wish. In all these breathing exercises, the back of the nasal passage should be relaxed, and you should breathe through the nose, never the mouth, as though you were smelling a flower. If you do this and relax inwardly, you will find that the air strikes the back of the throat before it is felt at all, and you will never notice the air in the nose itself. Practice this every day until you become proficient. The best way to ensure this is to close the lips while keeping the teeth separated, then throw down the under portion of the jaw. Developing Exercises 2. A certain amount of exercise should be taken each day. The particular character of exercise, which will be found beneficial for the maintenance of health, also for development of psychic and mediumistic gifts, are those which develop the vitality of the inner organs about the waistline. Bending exercises of all kinds are especially useful. Large muscles are not required for good health, but energy and endurance are. The following four exercises will be found very helpful in this connection. A. Stand erect, raising both arms over the head as far as possible. Raise yourself on your toes and, at the same time, stretch upwards with the fingertips as far as you can, as though trying to lengthen yourself. B. Stand as before, arms raised over the head. Now bend forward and try to touch the floor with your fingertips without bending the knees. Again, raise yourself up to a standing position very rapidly. This is a well-known but very useful exercise. 
C. Stand as in exercise B and bend the body sideways from the waist as far as possible. First to the left, then to the right. Make this motion as rapid as you can. D. Stand as before and bend slowly, trying to touch the floor with the fingers. As you do this, take in a deep breath. The purpose of this exercise is to compress the liver from above and below at the same time, and this massage will prove very helpful. Health Hints Other points to be observed in maintaining good health are the following. 1. Eat as little red meat as you can, since this is acknowledged by all to retard psychic development. 2. Eat a certain amount of fruit every day, not in addition to other food, but in place of it. Acid fruits are particularly beneficial in nearly all cases. 3. Drink at least a quart of water each day. 4. Accustom the body to cool baths. It is best to begin these in the summertime and continue them in the winter. 5. Wear as little clothing as you can, consistent with warmth. The skin breathes as well as the lungs, and free circulation of air on the surface is essential. The powers of the mind. We now come to the mental factor. Few realize how important this is in the development of psychic gifts. If the mind be depressed, worried, scattered, and unable to concentrate upon any definite thing, good results can hardly be hoped for in any way of psychic development. Many psychics can obtain good results for individual sitters, but as soon as they make a public appearance they fail more or less completely. We can hardly doubt that the reason for this is their apprehension for the results, fear they will not succeed, etc. This prevents all free communication. It shuts the doors of the soul, as it were, against any outside influences. In order to be receptive and sensitive, we must have a free mind and give ourselves up wholly to those forces and vibrations which play upon us. If you watch yourself, you will find that your body tends to contract all over as soon as you think certain thoughts, or experience certain emotions, such as jealousy, hatred, envy, etc. On the other hand, as soon as you send out thoughts of friendship, love, sympathy, etc., you find that your whole being expands and relaxes. If this is true of the muscles of the body, how much more true it is of the muscles of the soul, if I may so express it? The imagination, it has been said, is the lungs of the spiritual life, and in order to have free play they must be unrestricted just as our physical lungs are. The essence of psychic development is this complete surrender and quiescence, and until this is ensured, full development can hardly be expected. There is such a thing as spiritual contraction. We have all heard of the man with the ingrowing conscience. This means simply that this man is dwarfed contracted and unsympathetic in his attitude to all that he meets. Gentleness and cheerfulness, said Robert Louis Stevenson, are the perfect duties, and we cannot do better than advise the medium to follow this motto in his daily life. Psychic Contagion These influences which are harmful in ourselves are harmful when experienced in others, and they are contagious to a remarkable degree. All experienced spiritualists know that a medium is liable to take on the conditions of a spirit or of another person when in a sensitive state, and this is true of his mental and spiritual life as well as his physical health. We can acquire the other's irritable disposition, his sourness and lack of balance, for the time being, just as easily as we can acquire other symptoms. And unless this is recognized, and the medium takes care to throw off these influences, they are liable to remain with him more or less and influence him, just as we sometimes experience the after-influence of a bad dream in the daytime. How to choose a good developing medium The practical conclusion to be drawn from all this is that it is very dangerous to the mental and moral health of a psychic to develop under the guidance of a medium who is mentally, morally, physically, or spiritually ill for these conditions will possibly sooner or later be taken on, and they are liable to influence the medium to his own detriment. Be most careful, therefore, in selecting the psychic under whom you develop, for your own future progress and happiness will depend largely upon that. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Hubert Carrington Chapter 7 Know thyself was the mandate of the Delphic Oracle. 
before man can undertake to govern and control external forces he must learn to control those within himself for only by doing this can success be attained man utilizes his mind as he would a tool every day of his life the better we understand our tools the better workmen we are hence he who would succeed must understand the workings of his own nature the cosmic currents first of all we are told that there are cosmic currents playing to and fro in the world contradictory currents or streams of thought into which we are liable to enter unconsciously even against our will some of these currents are beneficial others are harmful some natures are strong to stem the tide and achieve success against the greatest obstacles others can extricate themselves but partially others do not do so at all for this reason we have the successes and the failures in life it depends partly upon outside influences partly upon ourselves the first we cannot control except indirectly through ourselves how to make a success of your life here is the explanation of a great fallacy which many people make they imagine that they can be their own will mold circumstance to soothe themselves this is only partly true let me explain we must not turn our power of mind upon others we must turn it upon ourselves in such a way that it will make us stronger more positive more capable and more efficient and as we develop in this manner success will come of itself the way to control circumstances is to control the forces within yourself to make a greater man of yourself and as you become greater and more competent you will naturally gravitate into better circumstances we should remember that like attracts like for as dr larson says those people who fail and who continue to fail all along the line fail because the power of their minds is either in a habitual negative side or is always misdirected if the power of mind is not working positively and constructively for a certain goal you are not going to succeed if your mind is not positive it is negative and negative minds float with the stream we must remember that we are in the midst of all kinds of circumstances some of which are for us and some of which are against us and we will either have to make our own way or drift and if we drift we go wherever the stream goes but most of the streams of human life are found to flow into the world of the ordinary and the inferior therefore if you drift you will drift with the inferior and your goal will be failure the three laws of success in order to achieve mental and spiritual success three rules must be observed which are of prime importance the first is that you must have in your mind a clear conception of what you want if you have not any definite goal in view you cannot expect to achieve any great success because you will be constantly wasting your energy in byways without directing it all towards one certain point the second is 
you must make your thinking positive and not negative. This does not mean that you must grind your teeth, frown and try to dominate everyone you meet. It means that you possess a calm self-assurance and the inner conviction and the certainty that you will succeed. Physically, this state of things may be felt in a full, firm sensation throughout the nervous system. The third rule is, all your thinking must be constructive, that is, built about the goal or object you have in mind. If you spend only a fraction of your energy of thought in any one direction, you cannot expect to progress very far in that line. The runner who tries at the same time to work out a mathematical problem in his head will not be first in the race. Constructive thinking means that you must consistently and continually think of and about what you wish to accomplish. The sooner you learn to do this, the sooner will success be yours. Obstacles in life present great difficulties. Up to a certain point, they may be looked upon as helps to character and progress. And the more these are overcome, the stronger will your character ultimately be. At the same time, this may be overdone, and there is such a thing as kicking against the pricks. Flowing with the Tide if you're striving your best, and every man knows in his heart when he is doing his best, to accomplish a certain thing, and more and more difficulties seem to multiply, the further you progress. You may, under certain conditions, assume that it is not meant for you at this particular time to do this particular thing and you may shortly look back and see how you were prevented from undertaking something that might have proven disastrous. In this way, it is possible to float with these currents instead of stemming them to advantage. Mrs. Town tells us that she, at one period of her life, could do nothing on account of her desire to rest and sleep. She determined that she would give this full play. She went to bed and stayed there for fourteen days and nights. At the end of that time, she felt that at last she had had enough rest, and thence forward work became a joy instead of a burden. It proved to be the turning point in her life. Acting for our ultimate good. There are, therefore, cosmic currents swaying to and fro, flowing back and forth throughout the psychic universe. And the more we can sense or become receptive to these currents, the more will our life be guided and directed for us by an intelligent control, greater than our own. We all think that we know exactly what we want to do and what is best for us. Yet this is not always the case. To a mind vaster and more inclusive than ours, the more opposite of this may seem better for our ultimate good. For example, a dog has to have a tooth extracted. The painful operation of removing the tooth is all that the dog can see. To him, it is all painful, nothing beneficial. To us, on the contrary, who see not only what a dog sees, but more, it is clear that the dog will eventually be better for the removal of his tooth, though it is a painful experience. Applied to ourselves, it is most probably true that our painful experiences in life can be interpreted in a similar manner, and that many of them could 
we see them in that light for our ultimate good how these laws apply to psychic development now let us apply what we have learned to psychic development and the cultivation of mediumistic gifts we have found that there are magnetic and spiritual forces playing upon us from different directions here and there all over the world some of these are for our own good others are not we must learn to become sensitive to these currents which are beneficial to us and shut out those which are not how are we to do this in the first place it is necessary for the student who really desires to obtain this guidance to make certain renunciations or sacrifices he cannot be in the world and at the same time receive the spiritual perfection one cannot both eat one's cake and have it so you must make up your mind just what you wish to do many mediums unfortunately do not develop along these lines the cultivation of the spiritual self is not altogether the same thing as a cultivation of the psychic self obtaining psychic phenomena the one great reproach which has been made against many mediums and spiritualists is that spiritualists are everything but spiritual doubtless this is not true of spiritualists any more than the followers of any other religious faith human nature is weak and we all fall from grace but we are now only talking of those who sincerely desire personal spiritual enlightenment and who are willing to make some sacrifices in order to obtain it to those who are anxious to follow this path we would say that it is unwise to give two full directions thus early in your development this is a question which will be discussed more fully in chapter 42 for the present a few practical points may be helpful both in your daily life and your psychic unfoldment rules to follow as is so often insisted upon the health must be maintained if this is not done you render yourself liable to nervous exhaustion and through this to obsession your clear common sense and interest in the things of the world must to a certain extent be kept otherwise the judgment will become unbalanced cultivate sympathy harmony interest in your fellow beings cultivate your own sensitiveness along ordinary psychic lines by various special exercises when you obtain a certain number of psychic phenomena in this way you will be far more receptive than you were before cultivate at all times what may be called a listening attitude of the soul this is particularly important and practically valuable when you are in doubt upon any question retire to a quiet room and ask your own higher self what is the best thing for you to do at first these replies will be very vague and indistinct but as you progress in your development you will find that they will become clearer and clearer and you will soon get definite and clearly formed replies in answer to this mental questioning as soon as you have progressed thus far you may be sure that you have begun to sense the cosmic currents which flow about you and when once you have done this it is thenceforward only a matter of personal development this will be dealt with 
more fully in several of the chapters which follow. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them This is a LibriVox recording. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harward Carrington Chapter 8 The Cultivation of Spiritual Gifts There are two ways of regarding any particular fact. The first is to observe it from without. The second is to experience it from within. If we look at an orange, we observe it from without and we could never experience it from within unless we were the orange. The only things that can experience sensations from within in this way are minds. Each mind can inwardly experience and see objectively its own sensations and, as so far as we know, it is the only thing in the world which can do so. All psychic experience is, therefore, inward or sensitive, and can never be felt by another person, but must be experienced by him in order that he should appreciate and understand the mental state you yourself are experiencing. It is the same with psychic phenomena. If anyone experiences any phenomena of this character, he can never impart this knowledge to others, except in a very roundabout way, and for these others to understand the phenomena, they themselves must experience them. It is for this reason that it is so difficult for psychics to express and explain to outsiders the character of the sensations and phenomena they are experiencing. Everything being so largely symbolic, and our language being so poor in this direction, it is often very difficult for them to explain precisely what they mean. Developing Mediumship We do not know as yet exactly what mediumship is. There is much evidence to show that it is very often hereditary, and runs through three or four generations just like any other gift. With some, mediumship appears in childhood and seems to be a very part of their constitution. The majority, however, develop it later on in life as the result of coming into contact with mediums or developing it within themselves by experiments. Some retain their mediumship throughout life others experience it only for a few months, a few weeks, a few days, in some cases only a few seconds. In some cases mediumship is terminated suddenly, in other cases it is gradually lost through a period of years. One who has at any time experienced mediumship can usually recall it by reason of its persistence, no matter how long afterwards. Controlling Phenomena In mediumship, or when obtaining psychic phenomena of any character, we are as yet experimenting, as it were, with forces and laws as yet largely unknown. Just as the early scientists experimented with electricity, indeed, we do not yet know what electricity is. However, at the present day we can control it perfectly and it is to be hoped that the time will come when mediumship and all psychic phenomena can be controlled in a similar manner, even though we may never know the innermost essence of psychic power. If we could do that, it would be, at any rate, on a workable basis, so to speak. Mediumistic Exercises All mediumistic exercises develop this power to some extent but in different directions. The following are a few of the methods which may be pursued in cultivating and developing the psychic self and the inner spiritual center of our being, as distinct from purely physical phenomena. As before said, it is essential that we should understand and control ourselves before we endeavor to control outside forces. Much may be learned through what is known as 
introspection, that is, the turning inward of the attention upon the inner self, instead of outward upon the external world. If you close your eyes and do this and try to find out the nature of your true inner being, you will probably experience a peculiar sensation. You will find that, like happiness, it continually eludes you and that when you think you have grasped your own self, it is only a state of mind which has since passed and is now only a memory. Practice this introspection for a few minutes each day, and before long you will be surprised at your development in this direction, for you will be enabled to come into far closer touch with yourself than formerly. The inner self will become illuminated, as it were. Mastering the Self this practice will lead to the habit of escaping from our sense perceptions to which most of us are slaves. As you get away from these and are enabled to withdraw more and more fully into your inner self, you will experience a sensation of reality and the ability to perceive the truth of things in a manner hitherto undreamed of. Truth exists. We do not perceive it for the simple reason that the veil of sense is between it and us. Lift this veil and you will perceive truth clearly as in the light of day. This practice of acquiring greater mastery over self will also put you more closely in touch with the great magnetic power currents of the universe so that you will never feel exhausted or in need of nervous energy there being an unlimited supply of energy in this universe. All we have to do is to learn to tap it, which we can do by these methods of psychic development, and we can draw upon it in any quantity we choose. We will also be put in touch with higher conditions. How Spirit Unites Us with increased spiritual development and spiritual life, we will perceive that there is a universal brotherhood of mankind and that nothing is really separated from anything else, that we are not separated from our neighbor, but that we are united in the great universal infinite intelligence which combines all. We may compare ourselves to trees in this respect, each tree is apparently a separate being, whose leaves whisper to one another, and whose branches sometimes touch in the swaying of the evening breezes. But their roots are sunk deep into the ground and are often intertwined with another, while the common earth unites them all. In a similar way, we are united in the spiritual universe of which we form a part. Fundamentally, physically, we are united one with another. Meditation Meditation may be considered one of the methods by means of which we awaken the inner self and frequently awaken our spiritual or astral senses so as to cause them to function on another plane. At the same time, if this developing process is done properly, we build up walls of power about ourselves which others will find it impossible to break through by mental or hypnotic influence, even should they desire to do so. We cover ourselves with a sphere of energy through which nothing can pass against our will. The Power of Thought All Thoughts sent out by us into the universe have some definite purpose and have a certain effect both upon ourselves and upon others. Thoughts are things. We can create a thought as surely as we can create a house or a chair. And once created, there is no telling where this thought may stop or how lasting its actions may be. If these thoughts are good, helpful, and useful, they often return to us like boomerangs with the added happiness and power which they have accumulated from others of a similar character 
in their flight through space. On the contrary, evil thoughts come back to us in the same way, and it will be found that they always return to their sender, with added power for evil or for good. See to it, therefore, that you only send out thoughts of the highest and best. Some people, when they first realize this fact, are almost afraid at first to think at all, for fear of the effects their thoughts may have. But this is a great mistake. Expression is the first law of life. We must learn to express. Express. The chief outward difference between a living being and a corpse is that one can express itself and the other cannot. Do not be afraid to express yourself fully and forcibly in any direction. Even the bodily expression of our feelings and emotions is quite justified. There is nothing to be ashamed of in conviction or in passion. It is the abuse of these which is detrimental. The Use of the Will In a similar way, the power of the will may be used for good or for evil, as the case may be, and it has a great power in both directions, as the history of occultism has shown us. In the one case we have, as the result of the exercise of this power, various psychic phenomena, marvelous cures, and all the varied accomplishments of this world. On the other hand, we have the phenomena of witchcraft, black magic, harmful absent treatment, and crime. It all depends into which channel we direct the energy of our will. The soul must learn to find and experience itself fully before it can consider itself thoroughly alive and a fully developed entity. After this realization has been accomplished, then and then only should we direct our attention to cultivating and directing the latent energies which we possess. Self-Development Essential It is because of this fact that self and soul culture is necessary before psychic phenomena are cultivated to any great extent. We must learn to know ourselves, to preserve a just and careful balance of judgment, sympathy, understanding, and intuition. If we do not possess these qualities, we shall never become mediums on the highest plane. On the contrary, we may draw to ourselves while developing mediumship harmful or lying intelligences which we have attracted into our magnetic aura. So, I cannot too strongly advise and warn you to practice these self-developing exercises before cultivating external psychic or mediumistic powers. Mediumship opens the doors to influence and powers over which we have little control, and we must be sure that, before the doors of the soul are swung back, we must be prepared to receive whoever enters, by reason of our own self-control and inner powers. Otherwise, we may be unable to close the doors when we wish to, or the door of reason may become altogether unhinged. In giving these warnings, I do not wish to frighten the reader, since there is no necessity to become alarmed if caution be exercised in this development. Only, I wish to emphasize the necessity for this caution. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them This is a LibriVox recording. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harward Carrington Chapter 9 Psychometry What is psychometry? Dr. J. Rhodes Buchanan says, The word psychometry coined in 1842 to express the character of a new science and art, is the most pregnant and important word that has been added to the English language, coined from the Greek psyche, soul, and metron, measure. It literally signifies soul measuring. In our modern use of the word, however, 
it means something a little different from this. A psychic who picks up an object and in connection with it gets certain psychic impressions is said to psychometrize the object, and this process is known as psychometry. EXPERIMENTS The famous Professor Denton, a mineralogist, whose wife possessed remarkable powers in this direction, conducted a number of experiments, some of which are described as follows. He gave his wife a specimen from the Carboniferous Formation. Closing her eyes, she described swamps and trees with their tufted heads and scaly trunks, with the great frog-like animals that existed in that age. He got a specimen of the lava that flowed from the volcano in Hawaii in 1848. His sister, by its means, described a boiling ocean, a cataract of golden lava that almost equaled Niagara in size. A small fragment of a meteorite that fell at Painesville, Ohio, was given to his wife's mother, a sensitive who did not then believe in psychometry. This is what she said. I seem to be traveling away, away through nothing right forward. I see what looks like stars and mist. I seem to be taken right up. The other specimens take me down. His wife independently gave a similar description but saw it revolving and its tail of sparks. Not due to telepathy. Professor Denton took steps to prove that this was not mind-reading by wrapping the specimens in paper, shaking them up in a hat, and allowing the sensitive to pick out one and describe it, without anyone knowing which one it was. Among them was a fragment of brick from ancient Rome, antimony from Borneo, silver from Mexico, basalt from Fingal's cave. Each place was described correctly by the sensitive in the most minute detail. These are but examples which could be multiplied, did space permit. Nearly everyone possesses a certain amount of power in this direction, and it only needs cultivation to bring it to light. Before proceeding to the practical side of this question, a few words of explanation of the theory involved will doubtless be of interest to the student. The Explanation it has been said that every object possesses its own peculiar psychic influence, fluid, or aura, which may be recognized by one sensitive enough to perceive it. Human beings may transfer a certain amount of this fluid to objects, leaving them impressed with their influence. We see this in the case of magnetic cures, and in some cases of haunted houses. In fact, as we shall see in Chapter 28, devoted to that subject, this is one of the theories which has been advanced to explain haunted houses. Objects which have been worn close to the skin, or which have been brought into contact for a long time with the magnetism of any particular person, seem to retain a large share of this aura, and such objects may readily be psychometrized. Their aura may be read and interpreted according to the ability of the psychic. We often see demonstrations of this character given in public. Again, trans mediums are very sensitive to influences of this character, and if we place an object which has belonged to some person who has recently passed over into the hands of a good trans medium, he will frequently be enabled to get into contact with that person through the magnetism of the article in question, and in that way information may be obtained which otherwise could not have been secured. How to Preserve the Influence Articles of this character often lose their properties, their virtue, we might almost express it, by being left around or exposed to the handling of others. And for this reason, it is best to keep such articles carefully wrapped up in thin rubber cloth which may be procured from any drug store. In this way, their properties are preserved. Just what this influence is, with which the articles become impregnated, we are unable to say. Probably it is a form of the vital force which animates the universe. Yet, even supposing that this could flow into the object, and that the psychic could sense it, we have yet to explain why it should be that this particular vital energy should be enabled to arouse within the psychic the flood of information he receives. A Kasich Records Professor Draper has said, A shadow never falls upon a wall without leaving thereon a permanent trace, a trace made visible by resorting to proper processes. On the walls of private apartments, where we think the eye of intrusion is altogether shut out, and our retirement can never be profaned, 
there exist the records of our acts, silhouettes of whatever we have done. It is a crushing thought to whoever has committed secret crime, that the picture of his deed and the very echo of his words may be seen and heard countless years after he has gone the way of all flesh. There are certain analogies for this in the physical world. If sunlight falls upon a sheet of paper, and we place upon it a key, the outline of this key will be marked upon the paper, and may be recovered years later, by suitable means. If thoughts are things, they doubtless impress our surroundings in much the same way, and the objects which we psychometrize are influenced by means of our thoughts, and the human aura or fluid, so that they retain them within it, and may be read back by the sensitive. THE INTERPRETATION OF IMPRESSIONS RECEIVED In all psychometry we must remember that the interpretation of the impressions received is largely symbolic, just as the printed word of a book is symbolic of the thought of the author lying behind it. So impressions stored within objects and sensed by the psychic must also be symbolic, and must be suitably interpreted by the psychometrist. Thus, when he places a geological specimen on his forehead, and describes an antediluvian monster, roaring and walking about, no one but a very shallow individual would imagine for a moment that the psychometrist was actually seeing the original. He simply got an impression of that era of the world's history, and symbolized it subconsciously in the form of this roaring monster. In obtaining impressions from an object, we must endeavor to become as receptive and sensitive as possible. A few preliminary exercises will enable you to do this to much better advantage than you otherwise would be enabled to. Exercises for Developing Sensitiveness 1. Cultivate the sensitiveness of your fingertips. You may do this effectively by placing in a bowl water of the same temperature as the body. Now close your eyes and place your fingertips just above the surface of the water. Without looking, very gradually lower the fingertips until they come into contact with the water. See whether you can tell when this is the case. You will be surprised to discover that, at first, you are quite unable to tell when you have touched the water. 2. Another good exercise is to take a pair of compasses, and, opening them a quarter of an inch or so, touch the fingertips with the two sharp points, the eyes being closed. See if you can tell how far apart these points are, before looking at the compasses. In this way, your fingers will acquire a sensitiveness of their own. 3. Learn to act upon first impressions. Do not hesitate or be afraid to express exactly how you feel and the impression that comes to you, no matter how ridiculous it may be. There is a useful saying which may help you in this respect. It is, The first thought is the spirit's. The second is your own. So learn to act on first impressions, and put into execution immediately anything which comes to you. 4. Analyze your own sensations and emotions as best you can, after the first impression has been received, and see what you feel or experience within yourself. Then express this in words to the best of your ability. These emotions often express, in that form, facts which could not well be expressed in any other way, though they apparently have no connection with the object. For example, if you are feeling a watch, and you get in connection with that watch the feeling of depression and pain in the throat, state this fully, since the person who owned the watch may have strangled himself in a fit of melancholy. In this way, the emotions you perceive are fully in accord with the sensations which you receive from the object. Its practical value in daily life. The practice of psychometry will often enable you to tell the characteristics of another living person, and by this means you will be enabled to tell whether or not you will like such a person, because you may be attracted or repelled by the psychic impressions you receive in connection with the object such a person has been wearing. In practical life, information of this character is at times very useful. In addition to all this, the cultivation of psychometry is often useful in paving the way for the cultivation of other psychic phenomena, and will prove a useful introduction to them. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington 
Chapter 10 The Human Aura Surrounding every living body, and some non-living materials, there is a halo or aura which may be seen under certain exceptional conditions. Clairvoyants have always contended that they could see this aura surrounding human beings, but they were laughed at for their pains by the majority of scientists who continued to disbelieve in its existence. About the middle of the 19th century, Baron von Richtenbach published a book on the aura, paying particular attention to the emanations which his sensitives had seen coming from crystals and the poles of horseshoe magnets. It is now known that both magnets and crystals give off a very noticeable aura, and this may be seen by anyone possessing even moderate psychic development, if they observe these objects when placed in a darkened room. How studied by the aid of chemical screens. Needless to say, all this was disbelieved at the time, and it was not until 1911 that the existence of the aura was proved scientifically by means of mechanical and chemical means. Dr. Kilner, the electrician of St. Thomas Hospital, London, then showed that it is possible for anyone to see the aura issuing from a living human being by means of especially prepared glass slides containing a chemical named dicyanin. The subject of the experiment is placed against a white or black cloth background in a nearly darkened room and must be at least partially nude as the aura cannot be seen through the clothing. The investigator then looks through one of the chemical screens at the daylight. Then, closing his eyes, pulls down the blind so as to make the room nearly dark. In this light, the figure of the model can be seen only faintly, and if the subject is looked at through the glass screen, the aura may be seen by nearly anyone possessing good eyesight. In this case, the investigator does not have to be a clairvoyant, since the eyes are rendered susceptible to certain artificial light waves by means of the chemical screens. Usually our eyes cannot perceive these waves. In this way, the skeptical world has been convinced of the reality of the human aura, and it is now considered a proved scientific fact. The three auras thus disclosed. The human aura or atmosphere consists of a number of layers or strata one beyond the other, extending out into space. By means of Dr. Kilner's chemical screens, three of these divisions may be clearly perceived. First, what is called the etheric double, this is seen like a dark line, slightly grayish in color, which extends over the whole surface of the body, conforming exactly to its shape. Doubtless, this is one manifestation of the double or etheric body. Beyond this extends the inner aura, which is usually two or three inches broad. It conforms to the contour of the body throughout and is more or less colored by the health of the individual and by the mental or emotional states which may be present at that time. Beyond this again is the outer aura, beginning where the inner aura ceases and extending from three to six inches as a rule before it becomes invisible. It extends slightly further in the case of women than it does in men. This aura is very variable and is greatly influenced by all the mental and psychic conditions of the person to whom it belongs. Its colors vary also very greatly, but this cannot as a rule be seen through the screens because they themselves are either dark red or blue. It takes a trained clairvoyant to see all the subtle gradations and variations of color in the aura. How to train your psychic sight. The best way to train yourself to see auras of this character is perhaps the following. 1. In a darkened room, study the aspect of a good horseshoe magnet, either suspended in the air by a silk thread or placed on a support with poles up, and vary the position of the observation until a faint luminosity is observed at the poles and along the edges of the magnet. 2. In the light, repeat the same process, trying to make out these lines and the extensions and limitations of the aura. It must be understood that this vision can be obtained artificially only through the action of the will, and by a proper focusing of the eyes, the perception of auras requiring a very different focus from ordinary sight, and this focusing is very often, nearly always in fact, different in each of the two eyes. The attempted focusing of the sight must therefore be made with each eye separately, and then with both combined. It may happen that one eye only can be focused for this special vision, or when both are found available, if both focuses are not identical, the active use of both eyes at one time may destroy the psychic side of the sensitive eye. The Aura in Daylight and Darkness It is important to master the faculty of seeing the magnetic aura in the daylight, because more complete details can thus be eventually obtained than in the dark, and this is the only way to learn how to perceive the human aura. For the purpose of trying one's vision in broad daylight, 
Take a good horseshoe magnet and hold it perpendicularly in front of you, either against the background of an open outside light, such as can be obtained from looking out from the inside of a room through an open window, or against a near inside background, for instance a white or dark wall, according to the nature of the light. Then look at the edge of the magnet with one eye only, and gradually approach it or slide it away from you, until you obtain the best focus of vision. Look steadily along the same point, until it dawns on you that a kind of a quivering narrow band of mist or vapor is flowing from the metal and prevents your sight from freely perceiving the object back of it, producing in fact a sort of bending of your visual rays. As soon as you realize the presence on the edge of the magnet of this current of vaporous mist, which may be compared to the appearance of the heated air which arises in summertime from hot fields, the first psychic visual victory has been obtained, and the perception of the other phenomena connected with the aura will only need time, perseverance, and practice. And once the magnet is conquered, one may expect to speedily obtain the sight of the beautiful and intricate currents on the human body. The Structure of the Aura after the aura has been perceived and its general layers distinguished, the student must turn his attention to its structure and color variations. The question of color will be treated in the next chapter, which is devoted entirely to that subject. As to the structure or composition of the aura, if this be studied carefully, it will be found that it is composed in a great variety of different ways, according to the object or person emitting it. Thus, the aura of flowers is very different to that of magnets or human beings. The Aura of Flowers It is a very interesting study to try and perceive psychically the composition of the aura of various flowers. For instance, that of the violet is about one-eighth of an inch in thickness and composed first of a bright light, then a line of dark blue, shading away into a very light blue, all these following the contour of the edge of the leaf. Above these lines is a scalloped or semi-linear string or border of two rows of little purplish-red figures diamond-shaped, very regularly distributed, so as to form two sets of fourteen little diamonds over the space of each small lobe of the leaf. Then, above these, a wave of dark blue mist in crescent form, shading off into light blue. This is only a sample reading of one flower. Each flower has its own particular aura, some of them being very complex, but it will serve to show the student how interesting a study this can be made. The study of the aura of plants alone, carefully undertaken, would occupy considerable time. The Human Aura and How to Study It After you have studied the auras of magnets and plants in this way, you should turn your attention to the auras of living human beings. Children may easily be studied, and their auras are exceedingly interesting. Developed clairvoyants are enabled to see several different auras each of them being composed of a number of subdivisions, and each subdivision having a different structure and color. It is a good plan to begin the study of the aura by the aid of the chemical screens, before mentioned, in semi-darkness, and then to practice viewing the aura without the screens, and, as the eyes gain sensitiveness, to admit more and more light, until it can be clearly seen in the daylight. In this way, your psychic sight will be gradually and naturally developed. End of chapter 10